So Green Jeans grows for, corn on the land. He rents for price of 500. Suppose Green Jeans develops a new genetically modified organism GMO that decreases production cost uh, for corn of 300. Green Jeans will pay uh, land rent of 800 if... Um, so what did you do with it? Uh, I didn't really know how to illustrate it. I just kind of explained what I thought the answer would be. That's kind of one of my questions. Okay, the, the way this author, it seems like he uses illustrate, but that doesn't necessarily mean a graph um, is what I've picked up. So um, how did you explain it? You might do this with a table or maybe an equation or something, but I think that's why he uses the word illustrate is that you could, you could approach it different ways. Um, I just kind of explained it and said that basically he would need to create a patent for his GMO. And if he didn't, then competition would start to basically use the same exact GMO uh, since it's better. And so, or it lowers the cost. And then the person, the landowner is allowed at that point to raise the rent if he doesn't create a patent up by the 300 of the cost that is saved. So okay. making it $800. That's basically what I put it. All right. Other people, how did you approach that one? Uh, that's basically how I did it, as far as getting the 800 and, and saying about competition and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, I think that I definitely thought when he said illustrate a graph, which I didn't know how to do, which I was glad that Luke answered or asked that question about number yeah. one. Um, but I'm glad that cleared it up. Yeah, so I think the author's just trying to, to get you to use the leftover principle and say that uh, I kind of posed this question in class too, that what would keep the landlord from getting all of the uh, additional, right? Like how can you capture that? And so having a patent or some sort of protection um, might allow you to do that or to keep it a secret, I think is part of what the text pointed to. Um, but otherwise the, the leftover principle says how much the willingness to pay is. Um, in reality, there might be market forces of other industries and surrounding land that would not make you pay the maximum you could. So this is the willingness to pay principle is like your maximum willingness to pay uh, would be the 800. And so if the landowner had a monopoly and perfect information, they might be able to extract that additional 300 from you. Um, but otherwise there could be other reasons why that wouldn't happen. So any further questions on that? Any other homework problems from 10 to review? Can we do three? Three, sure. Fair trade cocoa. So you are an economist for an NGO that is organizing a certification program for fair trade cocoa producers. Assume one, the annual output of land is 100 units of cocoa per hectare. The initial price of cocoa is $12.40. Um, farmers have bank accounts that earn 10% a year. The labor cost for wages for cocoa workers is 400 per hectare and the other non-land cost for cocoa is 200 per hectare. Under a fair trade agreement, farmers will increase wages to 500 per hectare. Predict the quantitative effect, in other words, a number of the wage boost on the market value of cocoa land. All right, does anybody wanna take that one? Maybe we'll just rotate. How about uh, Nate? What did you do for this one? And you might be muted. If yeah, yeah, I was right. muted. That, was that, that happens. Find. I'll have to get kind of used to that. With uh, I was trying to find the unmuting. <laughs> and you said for number three, right? 
Yeah, three part A. So everybody be ready to share their work. I'll just start calling on some people randomly and then maybe we'll have other people um, chime in as, as we need to. All right, just one second. I did it on my laptop, so I'm getting that to pull it. I'm like pulling it up right now. Okay. <laughs> You guys can have your work opened and then I can stop the screen share. Let me let me see what would work better. I don't know. Maybe I could go. Let me go see if I can get to Nate's work faster. Then I can kind of flip around too. Uh, yeah, but for number three, number I'm three, just not I'm really sure, sure how to do how that. One. Yeah. I understand how to get the 600. I was just confused how they got the 5,400. How did you get the 600? I just thought that was wrong well, and I got the 5,400. Yeah, I thought the 600 was the 400 for the wages and the 200 for the non land cost. I, I thought that's how you get it. But it Okay, so uh, Luke, you assumed it was wrong and made a modification. Is that what you just said? Yeah, basically, I thought the 600 was wrong. Maybe they just forgot a number. Um, okay. Because what the math I did didn't add up, add up to that. I thought they assumed, I thought they typed up on the 600, and I got the 5400. So. So Nate, you weren't comfortable with this answer or what? what? What did you do here? And you're muted, probably if you're speaking. Oh yeah, I just wasn't really comfortable with number three because I didn't know how they got the 600, so I just tried to put numbers in that the 400, 200 was the 600 and it equals the 5400. To the increase of the price. Right. I'm not sure how they got it. That's why it's hard to know. Okay. Um, let's see here. If anyone else got a different answer, I'd like to see how they did it. How they did it. They got did anybody problem. did anybody get an answer where they didn't modify the problem? Well, I basically did what Olivia did and added the 400 and 200 at 600 and added 5,400 divided by the 600. That is basically 629. There's, I did not know how to get it. So I just got the answers and worked back. But you showed your work, JC? Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically 400 plus 200. 600 and then 600 times something, 5,400 plus 9. I don't know what that okay, is. Here's, right. here's your work, JC. Uh, no, it's in the, I sent an extra picture for that one. Ah, I see it. Okay. Here? Yeah. Sorry about the paper. I just, just so 600 plus 200 and 600 times nine. Do you see you're muted if you're? Uh, it made no sense. Uh, that's the only way I figured out how to get 5,500. Okay, so you were just figuring and pulled a nine out of your butt, is what you're saying. Yes. I, have no idea. Hey, so I think I might have an idea of how to figure this out. All right, what did you have, Kyle? So I did the 400 plus 200 equals 600. And then I took the 400 plus 500 equals 900. Then I divided by, the, by 100, and that's how I got 9. And then I took the 9 times 600 equals 5,400. Oh, okay. So you got yeah. the uh, productivity, basically. Yep. Um, mic drop. <laughs> Let me try to pull yours up here.
Oh, but you didn't submit. Yeah, I did. Uh, chapter 10, end of the chapter questions. I got nothing on you. On module seven? Uh, no, this is module, this is on, it says chapter 10, end of the questions. So you put it in maybe a different spot. It's not in mod seven, it's in, it's in actually mod four. There's a folder marked chapter 10, end of the chapter questions. Yeah, my bad. I think I submitted in mod seven. Okay. Well, that's all right. I think we'll skip. Did, did that answer? Um, who asked this originally? Uh, Olivia. You want to explain? Did you get that, Olivia? What Kyle just said? Yeah, I kind of get what he's doing. Okay. That, that Could Olivia really 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 because I'm assuming he used formulas to get his modification on it? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did I did a formula from the book. The uh, Rx, Rx total revenue minus cost, minus cost, minus cost. Because I tried using that, I didn't get the freight cost. I, there was no freight cost. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, I did. I did. I did a formula from the book. Yeah, I did. Because I got my answer for that, and then I did put that number into the present value one, and I put the R over R um, to get the answer. Um, Kyle, I just pulled your chapter 10 out of that folder, but there seems to be only one page. It looks like you're a, it, this would be your um, review questions, maybe. There's only like one page. Yeah, I did the. I get it. I get. I got. I found. Yeah, one three five, five seven, seven nine. nine. Yeah. No, I found it. Okay. So it's this one right here. Yeah. Where, yeah, was, where I was I actually supposed, supposed to have that? that? Uh, there's a chapter ten folder in in mod four. Okay. My bad. I just, I just seen chapter, chapter 10, ten on mod, mod seven. seven. Yeah. Just resubmit that. Resubmit that later. Um, so yeah, here's your 400 plus 500 is the 900, and then uh, per unit ends up giving you the nine. Right. And then you've got the 600 times nine, which is where JC picked up on it. Okay, I think we've killed that horse. Any other problems to review? <clears throat> I'd say the slope one, the one off the uh, Number five. Consider a manufacturing firm that occupies one hectare of land. The firm transports over half of its output on trucks via interstate highways four miles to the east of the city center and transport less than half of its output on airplanes that leave from an airport seven miles from the center. Draw the firm's bid rent function. All right. Well, since I have Kyle's handy here, I just submitted at the other mod too, mod so, so okay. get back to all the regular ones. It should okay. be there now. All right. I got this one pulled though here. So this is since Kyle's was handy. So you had the slope changing. Yeah, I was I wasn't a hundred percent sure on how to do this one, but I knew it was going uh, from the four to seven. And then it, on the X's, it took uh, the zero to four, and then I kind of took that distance, and then the four to seven, and then the seven to ten. So I'm not 100% sure if I got this right or anything like that, but that's kind of what I thought it would be. Okay, so let's, anybody else on this one? Do you want to do it from zero to ten? Let's see. How about Let's see. How about Olivia? 
I had the same thing as Kyle, kind of, because we worked on it together. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. All right. Did anybody get anything different? I think having two separate ones off the top of my head, again, I haven't reviewed this one that closely, but it's not changing. It's just half of their production. So there could be two separate ones. Jessica, what do you do? I pretty much had the same as what Kyle had too. Yeah. Mine looks a little different, but I'm not 100% confident in it. But it still looks a lot different than what they put up there. This you got is it, Luke. We believe in you. <laughs> It's basically saying there's two separate curves is, the, is what it's doing. And you guys have the slopes correctly identified. And because you're, you're doing half your output to the airport, which is just different. And if they, uh, let me see, your kind of space loader, wait a second, I'm sorry. Firm transports half its output on the trucks and transports less than half its output on airplanes that leave from the airport seven miles east of the city center. See, I didn't even get numbers for the slope. I didn't put any numbers on uh, for slope because I, I didn't think it gave us enough information for that. So I just kind of drew what the graph would look like um, from zero to four, from four to seven, and then from seven to 10. So I didn't actually put numbers down for the slope amount. Yeah, and there, and there, there are two separate, so I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that's the general gist of it being both, uh, both separate, so. Um, did, you, did you try drawing a graph that was a mixed graph, Luke? Uh, pretty much. It's not really mixed, but you can see where the, uh, the slopes start to change at different points. All right, let me pull yours up. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what you've identified is, is the part that would graphically look the same. If you didn't draw a graph, you're fine, but it's probably helpful to look at it as a graph because the problem does say from east to west, right? So four miles east of the city and transports less half and then leave from an airport, that's seven miles east. Oh, they do say both east. Okay, I was thinking it was east and west. And that's why the curve shifts even more steep is because it's still going east. You're still getting further away from your output. And so it says it's going to cut half and it's going to cut even more once you get further out. And that's, oh, that's what you did here. Okay. All right. I think we're good at that. All right. Any other last questions on homework? Last call. Oh, wrong thing here. All right, so we're gonna get. Oh, I grabbed it again. So <laughs> get used to dragging stuff around here too. Okay, so chapter eleven is a little bit of an extension of what we just got out of, um, except that it's going to be on office space rather than manufacturing space. So, um, you know, why do buildings get as tall as they get? Are they too tall or too short? How do we go through the decision-making process of how tall they should be? And then what about the land that they're built on? Um, should they um, in general, our land prices, you know, higher or lower at the, at the city center, and they're usually going to be higher uh, at the city center, except for when 
cities decay, like Detroit, Michigan, or some of the declining cities, then we might see their land start to be pretty cheap, especially if you have to demolish a, a building that's there. So that's the type of thing that we're going to look at um, in this um, chapter. Um, so for uh, the, the bid rent firm or the bid rent function uh, for land is going to be really built upon information rather than some sort of efficiencies with agglomeration being close to inputs and other things. Although it really is an input if we think about a person that works for me um, that needs to go talk to a, a person in another company. If we're all located in the central business district, then we can do that much more efficiently. And so that's what we mean by the information business. And so here's a little table to kind of get your noodle uh, uh, going here on this, that um, CBD means central business district. And so we'll do a little bit of modeling of whether our office is right in the center or whether it's located to the east and the west. And so if we have uh, a building that's right in the middle, then we will, through the principle of median location, will end up minimizing the travel distance. So if you think back to the models where we had the pizza delivery and the, uh, the, the ice cream cones on the beach, um, just using principle of median location, it was if you had to travel to each place, then it was most uh, cost effective to be right at the median location. So that's the same thing that's going on with this model. And now we can think about the number of blocks traveled um, if there's actual walking distance time to get from one place to the other. So this really highlights um, whether face-to-face -face interaction um, is important or not. And so here's a picture of the, of the distance and then ultimately the cost involved um, uh, as it relates to travel. So the further we go from the center, uh, the more our travel distance is going to increase. So similar to what we've done in the past, imagine that we've got firms uh, located at location A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. The median location is D. So at D is our central business district. And so each office is going to interact with another office one time. And so we can count, okay, D employee needs to talk to C, D needs to talk to B. And then we can look at um, the cost involved with each one of these. So this is more of a direct cost rather than a spillover effect. Remember that the spillover effect was maybe going out to the bar and having a beer with somebody and learning information, being around close people. This is, this is different in that it's a direct cost um, that the employee has to take time out of their day to physically get from one place to the other in terms of the travel distance. Okay, so um, this last statement here, the travel distance for information is minimized at the center and grows at an increasing rate as the distance from the center increases. Does anybody want to take a stab at why? So the, the distance grows, the travel distance, it grows at an increasing rate as the distance to the center increases. In terms of trips. If we think about the number of blocks that we have to pick, if I'm at position G, I'm going one back, one back, one back. So the back and forth movement here, if we go back to this. Is it because the total distance gets bigger progressively, like each time it gets bigger and bigger? Yeah, it progressively gets bigger and the trips get longer and you have to double back. So this little table right here kind of shows that idea of how we can go from 24 to 42, even though we're linearly just climbing one block, two block, three blocks, the number of trips uh, increases exponentially. And so that's kind of a interesting detail that, that happens when we go one, one, back, and then to get to A, I have to go this far of a distance and then back, um, ends up causing that effect. 
Okay. So that's our principal median location. So now um, we're going to first look at the bid rent function without input substitution. So when we think about input substitution, in this case, um, what would that mean in general? We used this in some previous chapters, substitution of inputs. Can anybody give me an example, just generically, not necessarily related to office space? Uh, I mean, something like using one supplier as opposed to another, like one paper yeah. supplier yes. to another paper sure. supplier. Yep. Yeah, so that would be one for one supplier versus another. Um, another could be just a more general, generalized uh, capital for labor. So as labor, if a minimum wage goes up, then I can start to substitute machines for labor. So right now we're going to have the bid rent function without input substitution. And here we're going to be focusing more in on uh, the land um, and what we can do with the land in different parts. So this little table at the bottom, this has no input, no factor substitution or input factor, same thing. Um, so we've got distance in blocks. So zero, one, five, uh, and this is distance from the central business district. We've got a building height of four floors. We have a company that has total revenues constant at 510. We have a cost of capital of the building of $100 per square foot or whatever to build the building non-land cost, and then we've got this travel cost. So this is the element that we're bringing in on how much it runs to go from one place to the next. And so if you're at the center, you have less travel costs than if you're on the outskirts five blocks away. So your willingness to pay for the land then is using the leftover principle, you can afford to pay more for the land if you have this less travel cost. And so this is really just a reflection now of the change in the travel cost and how that's affecting you. And then your production site uh, is a quarter of an acre or a quarter of a hectare. And therefore, um, you 250 times four, if that's per acre, to put this on a per hectare basis, 250 times four, we're really dividing by a quarter, equals a thousand. And so now this gives us our bid rent function for the, um, for the building. Um, of what we could what we could do for the land. And that being the case then, this is just showing a bid rent curve that's downward sloping. And it is actually curved. So there's a little bit of a concave look to this. It's kind of, this picture doesn't show it very much, but it's potentially, um, your textbook has a few other pictures where it's curved in a little bit more. And that's just given the nonlinear relationship between the amount you're willing to pay per acre for land and the distance from the center, given those variables as we move out from it. Okay, um, so role of input substitution. What's going to happen when we do allow input substitution, which is the more realistic uh, case? So Capital and land are input substitutes in production and office space. So capital and land. So here, what if capital improvements and land could now be substituted? What would happen to our buildings? So in that previous uh, picture, we had four story buildings, but what if we could build taller buildings? What would happen to the land if we could do that? That's what so in, the price would increase. And the price would increase, yes. So that's going to be the relationship that will fold into this. Now, what most people don't know, um, you might be able to make this intuitively, uh, but as a former real estate developer, um, I ran into this a lot. When you go up to like three stories, um, possibly even four in some cases, you can use wood frame construction. But as soon as you get into high-rise buildings, the engineering totally changes and you have to use thicker drywall and metal studs and a different foundation. And so we get this relationship here on different size buildings, tall, medium, and short, and the land that it takes to use them and the building height. So if I build a really tall building, 
um, I can build it on a smaller piece of land. So we've got a 0 0.04 hectare of land to put a 25 story building on. But that 25 story building, oops, I didn't mean to click that. That 25 story building is going to be a lot more expensive per square foot. And so once you have to add things like an elevator, so a three story building doesn't require an elevator. People can use the, the stairs even though a developer might put it in some sort of elevator. Uh, but when you do that, you could have, again, this is just knowledge I have from uh, construction days. Um, you can use a hydraulic elevator, um, which is a lesser expensive elevator than a cable driven elevator that um, to go up higher floors. And so each floor you add, um, our rule of thumb used to be about $10,000 per floor is the additional cost of the elevator. Um, each floor you go up. Uh, which was average cost. Um, but at the first floor, if you do a marginal analysis, the, the fourth floor compared to a third story building that doesn't require an elevator, a four story building that does require an elevator, that fourth floor is actually pretty expensive. And then it's a lot cheaper to get up to the fifth floor and the sixth floor, each floor you add would be um, roughly $10,000. Okay, so that's uh, just the issue that we're bringing up here with um, dollars per square foot with taller buildings, medium sized buildings, and then one story buildings. Construction cost is going to vary per square foot. And then you've got um, the amount of land, you need more land for a short squatty building uh, versus that. So then we'll look at this interaction between the two. Okay, so um, this picture we're going to, we're not going to do a lot of isoquants and isocost curves um, because not everybody in class has had this. Uh, you guys who had intermediate micro had this. Um, so I'm just going to explain this, but we're also going to skip um, uh, some of the material where there's utility curves and indifference curves um, because I don't have everybody ready for that. So that's the good news. We'll be skipping some material, uh, but this one will be included. Um, and so an isoquant is a line that shows all the possible combinations of resources, capital and land, that could be used to produce a certain quantity. So the word ISO means equal. And so along this curve, if we imagine we're a, um, a finance insurance company, this is the amount of insurance policies that we produce every year is, uh, I'm just making up a number, 100,000 insurance policies. And so along this curve, it says, we could be at points T, M, or S to make 100,000 insurance policies. If we're at point S, we have a short building that didn't cost very much, but we have one acre of land, one hectare of land. If we are at point M, we can also do 100,000 uh, insurance policies. We can do it with less land, but I have to build a four-story building. That's gonna be $100 a square foot. And then finally, if I go with a 25-story building, it's gonna cost me here, I'm still only able to produce 100,000 insurance policies, but I'm gonna do it in a 25-story building on 0 0.04 land. Does anybody have any questions on that? Give me a thumbs up if that's good. All right. So um, here's our options for building heights um, that we can think of with the different combinations. Um, depending on what land rent is, we can use our leftover principle now to think about what we're willing to pay for each one. So even though we've got the uh, per square foot uh, changing on us. So again, here's the land size, the one acre. Here's now the the building with $40. So this is the squatty building. Uh, we have land and rent. So the short building is 90. The medium sized building is 150. And then finally, the building cost with rents of 1600 in the central business district, uh, we'd have a total cost of 15. So this then kind of gives us our our chart here of looking at the cost of doing a short building or a tall building or a medium sized building. So if we map that out, um, once we look at 
the differences here, I got these starred just to put in the dollars. So adding these dollars together gives us our willingness to pay, maximum willingness to pay for that tall building of $1,600. I could go up to $1,600 uh, for the tall building, or I could go up to $200 for the short building. And so remember, I can produce 100,000 insurance policies at either place. This then just shows my willingness to pay for, for each one. The factor substitution uh, is what gives us this bigger jump, and that's what we really see in central business districts is that the rent is just crazy higher than what it is out in the suburbs, but businesses still find it beneficial to locate in the crazy rent area. And these are, this is just uncovering some of the reasons why, uh, why we would expect to see that. And so this first curve here is the bid rent function without sub factor substitution that we did earlier. And so if we now have the ability to build a taller building in the central business district, we have this bid rent function, the JE up to 1600. And so is that more or less elastic? How many people say more elastic with a thumbs up? Is this bid rent function more elastic with factor substitution or less? More with a thumbs up less with a thumbs up. All right, I can almost see, I don't know if I've got Nate uh, Hamilton, did I see your thumb? What was your thumb? Which one? Why don't you unmute? What do you think, more or less? More. More, all right, survey says less. So remember the steeper curve is less elastic or more inelastic. So as these curves get steeper, they start to look like an I or inelastic is a trick that I like to use with more or less. So we have less elastic uh, with factor substitution. Okay, so we can kind of dissect the reasons why here. So remember this is blocks from the center from one block to five blocks. And so from A to E and J, A to J, like how do we get this distance where we're going from at, if you're at the city center, the most you could afford to pay was 856 before, but now I can pay this. Well, all this comes down to the travel cost savings. So if I move from point E to A, I have a $656 change from $856 down to $200, right? So I've saved, by moving five blocks away, I've saved $656. So we can start to think about the slope of this line as the money saved from moving away. And savings curve. Yes, kind of a little bit like a savings curve, right? So, and then from uh, point A to J, we end up, being indifferent between the two, but the 744. Whoops, I clicked that on accident. So the result, the bid rent, the change in the bid rent exceeds the decrease in travel costs, and that's why we get this, this big jump. Okay, um, so skyscrapers. So how tall should we make our building. It should just be a simple marginal cost, marginal benefit analysis, right? So I look at the benefits of that versus the cost and um, developers would then just choose um, who, you know, which, which one I should do according to a rational calculation of how much should I pay for the land and, and the benefits of my people being in the central business district. So, um, this is what that equation would look like. So I've got a building height as the horizontal axis. And so at a height of 50, the cost at the margin of the 50th floor was equal to the benefit of the 50th floor. And so my profit function 
profits are maximized at 50 floors. If I build 51 floors, the 51st floor costs me more than the benefit and therefore I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't do it. So the question is, what if there's kind of a prize for having the biggest building? Do cities boast about having the tallest building? Trump does. Yeah, Trump does. And so there's been some interesting stories on who does what and why, you know, if it's kind of a macho thing or if it's kind of a, you know, just to be a feather in the cap that we have the tallest building in Chicago or we have the tallest building in the United States. And so there might be some, some benefits to having the tallest building. And so now the question is, what if there's a $200 benefit to saying you've got the tallest building? Okay, so that's the game that we're gonna play. This is gonna change it into kind of a strategic behavior, a little game theory that we can look at, you know, Nash equilibrium. The problem is there can only be one tallest building, right? And so at the time you start your building, you've got the chance of, of somebody else being taller and then that would make you look pretty foolish. So if we build the tallest building here at 80 floors, we are losing, we've only got $700 profit compared to what I would have been at 900. But if there's a $200 value for building the tallest building, then that would offset that. And so we might start to see buildings be too high if we have um, a, a game like this. So profit from the losing the contest uh, is uh, profit from losing contest, yeah, 900, uh, the 50 floor building. To win the contest, firm one must make two's profit from winning less than 900. So if firm one builds a 51 story building, what would firm two do? If firm one says, oh, I'm going to win the prize, so we're playing a sequential game here, what okay. would firm two? And firm two would be like 52-story building. Right, I'd do 52. Yeah. Good. Uh, and so where is the Nash equilibrium going to fall? So firm one chooses 51, firm two chooses 52, a profit just below 1100. So what is going to be the equilibrium strategy for firm one? How high should they make it? Is it like a like they run them up until they don't make any money and then? Yes, so they, they still have to make it a non profitable move. So in a sequential game, firm one has the first mover advantage. And so if firm one chooses 80, Firm two would choose 81, but that would actually be less profit than what they would get if they did 50 stories. And so the optimal Nash equilibrium first mover advantage in a sequential game would be for uh, firm one to build an 80 story building because firm two wouldn't have the incentive to go to 81. All right, so that's our tallest building game. Of course, there's lots of different implications of, of that, that um, uh, there'd be uncertainty with it and some other things, but uh, that's, that's the idea of, of the tallest building. And so that's one of the reasons, or one of the ways economists have tried to model uh, why we see the buildings we do and the heights that they are. Um, some of it is a bit strategic and having that additional tallest building feather in your cap might make a difference. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about that. Um, yes, so th like this was different people would have different incentives. So like it could be $200 to one person and 300 to another and like a thousand to somebody else. Yeah, that's right, Kyle. And, and so what would really happen in a, in a situation is they would overbuild to make sure they had the tallest building, right? So they'd be shooting probably high, not knowing exactly how they do it. And so um, this is what we observe in the real world is that there is a, a pretty good size gap between the tallest building and the second tallest building. 
And so what looks wasteful maybe could be argued with, with some of this reasoning. Okay, um, that is it for today.